Hello, and welcome to episode number 79 of the Point of Convergence podcast. As always, I am your host, Exoacadamian. Within the enigma known as the UFO phenomenon, a few particularly troubling aspects have long existed as part of the literature. One specific aspect that has long been particularly concerning to many people involves the knowledge of and cooperation in what are deemed negative abduction encounters by apparently human terrestrial powers. In other words, our very own governments, or particular elements of them, willingly signing off on the abduction of and experimentation with innocent citizens. These kinds of accounts and evidence streams are particularly difficult to swallow because they not only involve humans agreeing to let other humans be experimented with, though of course we've seen that before, for instance during the horrors of the Nazi regime in World War II, but also because they involve communication and accord making between human beings and various alien species. For some, this is a bridge too far. Strange liminal creatures coming in and out of different dimensions is one thing, but gray aliens walking into a meeting room with government officials and negotiating treaties is something else entirely. And yet that's precisely what aspects of the experiential literature corroborated with additional historical evidence that have leaked out over time, are suggesting has indeed taken place as part of our relatively recent history. Part of these agreed upon accords involved not only the abduction of earth humans, but also the introduction of apparently hybrid beings into the earth population, entities who are part human and part alien, sometimes looking shockingly unlike us, and other times looking so much like terrestrial humans that they could pass by unnoticed. Here we are confronted with the notion of them walking amongst us, even as we speak. In the case we're going to review today, we have all of the above taking place. First, evidence of accords being made with not just one alien group, but a consortium of different alien species aligned, if only loosely, around various endeavors they are engaged with on our planet, with both Earth humans and terrestrial animal populations. Furthermore, the accord discussed in this case actually involves the directing of ongoing interstellar traffic around a particular location in the American Southwest, which for all intents and purposes serves as a space hub for aliens coming from locations as far flung as Zeta Reticuli. Finally, the case we're going to discuss today involves the attempted introduction of a particular hybrid being, part human and part something else, into the terrestrial population. How that attempted socialization of a hybrid being goes speaks to the challenges that arise in these kinds of experiments, not only because vastly different social context origins are in the mix, but also because the biological defaults are so different between the two species. Is it true that Earth governments have made accords with interstellar alien civilizations, and perhaps even with consortiums of various alien groups, and have these agreements included the experimentation with human beings resulting in hybrid entities who have then been introduced into the Earth population? In this particular case, these are precisely the matters we'll attempt to face head-on, seeking both for clarity and confirmation in this, the 79th episode of the Point of Convergence podcast. As I mentioned in the introduction, the elements of the UFO phenomenon literature that we're going to discuss today are unsettling to many. And to those it's not unsettling to, it's just difficult to swallow. This is a difficult pill to go down. It speaks to a whole different level of cover-up. Now, my journey has involved becoming privy to ever more expansive schemes supposedly designed to deceive the general public. This is a somewhat disconcerting revelation, of course, but this has been my journey. The more you go down this rabbit hole, the more you find that what we've been told about, for instance, 20th century history just doesn't line up with the evidence. Now, again, me included, I avoided these aspects of the UFO phenomenon for a long time. Was this my bias? I think it was, and I think it's helpful for us to admit that when we come across it. I found these elements too difficult to believe, too much of a stretch involving too much of a vast conspiracy 
and a vast scheme to deceive the general public. Clearly, there are people in positions of power who've known about these things and have willingly kept them from the public for decades and decades and decades. And of course, it goes much beyond just keeping knowledge from the general public. These agreements that I spoke to in the introduction have allowed for the abduction and experimentation with human beings, not to mention, of course, the animal kingdom as well. We're going to look at a book today that dives into these very topics, these concerning, disconcerting elements of the UFO phenomenon literature. The book we're going to discuss is called Rachel's Eyes, The Strange But True Case of a Human-Alien Hybrid. This is by Helen Littrell and Jean Bilodeau. Now, let me say this. I've been presented with evidence that I cannot deny as part of my journey as a podcast host, which might seem strange. But again, people reach out to you when you host a podcast and when they resonate with what you're saying, what you're presenting. And again, part of this podcast has been my own journey in trying to understand and grow in my understanding of what's really going on and how the different pieces work together. And while I can't talk about all of those details that have been revealed to me right now, what I will say is that elements from books like this are corroborated by other details that have been presented to me, even if at first these ideas seem beyond the pale. So when we come across these obscure books, it's worth paying attention. And I'm just saying to you now that I've seen evidence that supports these books. Now, as part of my journey, I've been pointed towards certain books that generally fly under the radar, that point to real historic events and reveal key details about ufological history. The truth is, as they say, lying in plain sight, even if usually innocuously so. Sometimes in books that aren't terribly well written and that feature seemingly amateurish covers. It is those details that often make these books fly under the radar. That and their seemingly outlandish historical claims, of course. Now, interestingly, this book was mentioned by Terry Lovelace, a UFO contactee and abductee, we've discussed before in this podcast in two specific episodes, in his interview with James Iandoli for Engaging the Phenomenon. Needless to say, this recommendation was passed his way via an important source, and I'll leave it there. This is a process of following the trail of breadcrumbs and of connecting the proverbial dots. Now, I also want to point out here that elements of the phenomenon are intimately involved in this process. What I mean by this is that it's not just about human beings connecting dots and following the breadcrumb trail when they come across it. But as I've said before, in my own personal journey, I have these brightness moments, is what I've called them, when something, some kind of intelligence tells me, look in this direction, this is important here, pay attention. So I think the same sort of thing happens with other people as well. And what I think this ultimately points towards is an ongoing engagement between elements of the phenomenon and various people across the planet, supposedly in preparation for something. And that's all I'll say for now. But just keep that in mind. This is not just about human beings digging for details. It's also about elements of the phenomenon helping people find those details, sometimes even while governments would like to keep them secret. Now, as I said in the introduction, central to this story is a hybrid, a hybrid being part human, part alien, who actually becomes socialized or they attempt to socialize her in normal human situations. Now, again, some people find this hybrid possibility just too much of a stretch. But let me just say, I have no doubt about this. I know people personally that I consider beyond a shadow of a doubt are hybrid beings. And I've also come across people who shared stories with me, people that I trust intimately, who shared stories about being introduced to their own hybrid children. And of course, this is part of the experiential literature going back decades. But I'm saying people have personally told me these stories. One story I'm aware of, for instance, involved this man who was introduced to his hybrid daughter on board a craft. And what's interesting here is, while I said some of them look quite like us and others not so much, this particular one didn't look so much like us. So his sort of fight or flight evolutionary tendency was to actually be revolted by her appearance. And yet simultaneously, he felt this connection, this spiritual connection. He knew immediately she was his daughter, even though there was nothing that would give it away in her appearance. 
Very, very interesting. This is a key component of the UFO phenomenon literature. This aspect involving genetic experiments and hybridization is central. You cannot get away from it. While some people would like to make this about UFOs and craft coming here on scientific expeditions, really this is about much more than that. There is direct intervention going on here with different elements of the phenomenon. But again, today our focus is going to be this one book, Rachel's Eyes, which again has the subtitle, The Strange But True Case of a Human-Alien Hybrid. And this is by Helen Luttrell and Jean Bilodeau. This is what the book promo says of its contents. Quote, This is Marissa Luttrell's true story, told by her mother, Helen. Marissa was blind, and in order to help with her college expenses, she shared her apartment with the mysterious Rachel. Marissa became concerned when it appeared that Rachel had no past. Little things Rachel said and did aroused frightening suspicions in Marissa, which led to conclusions so incredible that she could not tell anyone for fear of being thought crazy. Marissa had to confront her fears and face the consequences alone. In doing so, she was exposed to an alien world existing behind the looking glass, an alternate reality just beyond everyday consciousness, a world existing and waiting for anyone who dares to look into that mirror and accept what is there. It is often said that we have eyes and do not see. Marissa was blind, but she saw with her heart. Her roommate Rachel could see, but her eyes held secrets. This fantastic story, even its startling conclusion, reads like science fiction, but it's true. It answers the two important questions of why aliens have not landed on the White House lawn and why they haven't taken over the Earth. Marissa's story invites the reader to expand his vision to see the individual the soul, the world, and ultimately the universe through the eyes of a blind girl, her mother, and most importantly, through Rachel's eyes, unquote. So that promo kind of talked a little about what this book is about. The basic premise is, is that this girl, this teenager, was going to college. Her name was Marissa Luttrell. And in order to share expenses, because she couldn't afford this room, she took on a roommate. Now, interestingly, this roommate turned out to be this hybrid being, this half-human, half-something-else kind of being. And it worked well for the people that set up Rachel joining Marissa, because as I said, Marissa was blind, at least partially. She could only see sort of blurry shapes. So they thought this was a perfect situation where they could take a hybrid being and actually socialize this being in a normal human setting, but still with certain safeguards in place. For instance, This hybrid being, Rachel, would not actually attend classes. She would actually do her homework and her classwork from the apartment they lived in. And of course, Rachel was not seen by Marissa in her true appearance, at least initially, because Marissa was partially blind. So that gives you a sense of what the story ends up being about, the relationship between these two girls and how they both actually end up having very interesting backgrounds. And we'll get to that. It's not just... Rachel that has an interesting background. But before we get there, I just want to point out that this book is sort of told in two parts. The first part is written like a story that you read, but apparently it's a true story. The second part deals with corroboration of the story and further details. Now, what's interesting is before we get to the interaction between these two girls, we learn about someone who becomes a colonel who is put into a program within the military where he is briefed about extraterrestrials and extraterrestrial craft, and he eventually becomes central to the story and plays a central role in being promoted to a high position where he actually telepathically communicates with these various beings that are coming from other parts of our physical universe. So I want to jump to a part of the book where it talks about his training, when he actually learned about what the military understood about what was happening with these beings. And of course, it goes far beyond knowledge. It goes to cooperation. Quote, early Monday morning, Harry was back in his classroom. Part of him was eager to begin the next phase of his training, but another part was apprehensive about what he'd learn. The instructor began, this week will be devoted to the various types of craft recovered, including those that have landed without mishap. NASA conducts extensive laboratory analysis of recovered craft, and their findings are backed up by labs at MIT and other universities. 
the outcome is always the same. Materials and alloys unknown. Likewise, the method of propulsion is a complete mystery. Although the aerospace engineers are convinced that more than one method is used, depending on the design of the individual craft. They've tried to retro-engineer because there seems no other way to figure out how the propulsion systems work. But the government's equipment lacks the proper degree of sophistication to accomplish anything definitive." Unquote. Now, interesting right there, we have information that corroborates in some ways what Bob Lazar has talked about. Again, attempts to retro-engineer, attempts to understand how this propulsion system works, but often coming up empty because it is just so far beyond our understanding. As we've often talked about, it seems that consciousness, direct consciousness, communication between the craft and the beings often is in play. This instructor then goes on to say what some of these men's roles will be when they actually are promoted and go to this new destination. Quote, All you men will begin your new tour of duty as part of the security team at the projects. Your jobs will be to pick up the pieces of craft found at the crash site once the medical team has recovered its crew, if there are any live aliens. They'll be picked up and transported to the medical lab before you're allowed to go in. If they're dead, you'll still have to wait until they're put in body bags and taken to the pathology lab for analysis. Pausing, the lieutenant looked around the room to see how his students were handling this information. They silently waited for him to continue. You'll have a grid map of the area, and you'll be assigned to check each grid, one by one, until you're sure you picked up every last trace of wreckage. Most of the time, you'll have to wait until the heat dissipates. Sometimes the heat is so intense you can't touch a thing for hours afterwards. There's not that much urgency connected to that part of the investigation. It can take as long as necessary. You'll be undergoing a couple of days orientation on these things as soon as you get to the detachment." Unquote. So again, these men that are being trained in this classroom right now are going to be stationed at this base, and their job again is to actually pick up the wreckage from these craft that come in. Because the point that's made in the book is that very often the craft do land intact. And again, they're coming from different parts of the physical universe. And apparently an accord has been arranged so that they can land here. It's like a space hub, like I said in the introduction. But on occasion, they actually seem to crash. And it seems connected to the radar that is used either on the base or in that general area. And again, speaking corroboration, we've heard other details like that before. That even while the conventional wisdom is, these are sophisticated crafts coming across the galaxy. How could they crash so easily? How would we shoot them down? Well, apparently, a certain configuration of our radar could actually do this. And perhaps, again, because they just weren't prepared for this or whatever. But it's very interesting. In this particular case, we learned that some craft land intact and the alien beings are actually there to conduct experiments, sometimes short-term, sometimes long-term. Other times, the actual craft will crash, and then the bodies are recovered and analyzed elsewhere. So very interesting details. Shocking to many, of course. To some, it'll seem far-fetched. But again, I just want to say, I've come across evidence that seems to support these very kinds of notions so I suggest we take them seriously. And now we're going to move forward in the book again to a part where this lieutenant continues explaining what kind of craft are encountered. Quote, the lieutenant was explaining, these craft come in all sizes and shapes from small ovals 15 or 20 feet in diameter to long cigar-shaped craft the size of a football field or larger. A few are triangular in shape and very shallow in depth, but none of these have ever made a witnessed landing and we can only speculate on the extraterrestrial life forms that might pilot such exotic appearing craft. Every craft has two things in common, materials and method of propulsion unknown. Some project members theorize that the differences in appearance of the craft may be related to the purpose of its expedition to Earth. Larger craft with several inner compartments containing medical facilities and equipment are used in the abduction of humans and animals, allowing ample space to run their experiments. Smaller ships are believed to be used for reconnaissance. All of this is strictly conjecture. No one knows for sure, unquote. So in that section there, he's actually referring to other kinds of craft that have been reported seen over time and how the military has theorized about what those craft might be, what their purpose is, and where they're coming from. 
in distinction with the kinds of craft and beings that are part of this ongoing accord in this one particular location. And he talks about that next. Quote, the hybrids participating in the exchange project at Area 51 and Four Corners, by the way, that's the name of the location where this supposed base is, arrive in craft of the smaller type. We never find food supplies on board a vehicle. However, we often find plastic-like bottles containing a liquid resembling water, which we assume to be some type of nutritional supplement. The crews on some of the ships have an insect-like appearance. Chemical analysis has determined that they're chlorophyll-based life forms that seem to require a type of liquid nutrition, which they absorb through their skin because they lack a discernible digestive system. This may explain the containers of liquid discovered on their craft. Day after day, the class studied photographs and plans of the various types of craft. Their heads felt as if they would explode with all of the mind-boggling information. On Friday afternoon, the instructor finally said, that's enough for this week. I'm sure your brains need a rest. But men, take my word for it. You haven't heard anything yet. The best is yet to come. Unquote. All right, and now we're going to move forward in the book to when this Harry character has not only been stationed at the base, but over time he excels, and so he's actually given numerous promotions. Now, importantly, the question as to why he excels is an interesting one. One of the most startling, revealing, and consequential aspects of this book is how different characters all have histories that have more than meets the eye to them. They all have had different kinds of contact, even if they weren't consciously aware of it. So even this person, this military person who's been given various promotions, thinks he just had a normal human history, quote unquote. Later on, he finds out and we find out that nothing could be further from the truth. And that's what's interesting about these kinds of tales. And again, I think these are true, that often people that have encounters with these beings find out it stretches back into their childhood and sometimes even over multiple generations. And indeed, that's the case both for this man, Harry, who ends up being involved with Rachel. We'll talk about that in a minute. But also the mother of Marissa and Marissa herself, as I already hinted at, also have a unique history to do with the UFO phenomenon. And so what this suggests is the entire thing is being schemed, orchestrated by elements of the UFO phenomenon. We should pay very close attention to that because, again, I think that is key to what is going on in our reality as we speak. But I want to jump forward to a part of the book where this person, Harry, finds out that there is more going on at the base than has already been revealed. Quote, Harry had nodded, wondering where this was going. Bill had continued, there's a lot more going on at Four Corners than you know. You can't talk to the others about this. You with me on this? Again, Harry nodded, consumed with curiosity. Suddenly, Bill dropped the good old boy persona and became deadly serious. Harry, Four Corners is more than just a recovery operation. It's also a kind of embassy for extraterrestrials. We have a joint team of humans and the small greys working deep underground on several projects some of which are extremely complex. And with some of the more difficult concepts, our scientists run into communication problems. Now you seem to have a valuable quirk of a mind that lets you send and receive with our visitors. I'm assigning you to work with the team as an interpreter or ambassador, if you will. As a cover, this special assignment will be in addition to your regular blue team duties. So you'll be working long hours. You up for that? Harry's mind spiraled in several directions at once. Extraterrestrials actually working in a secret facility under the very ground they were standing on and on long-term assignment? And I'm to be an interpreter for them? My God. Am I to take your silence for agreement? Bill asked, enjoying watching the young airman struggling to embrace the bombshell he'd just dropped. Yes, sir. You bet, sir. When do I start? Harry had blurted out to Bill's amusement. Well, that's good, because they asked for you specifically. Apparently, they routinely probe the minds of the staff around here and seem to think you'll be ideal for the job. As for starting, no time like the present. Let's go to my office. Unquote. Now, again, very interesting there. We hear that the others are actually probing the minds of the humans on the base and seem to find almost by accident that this hairy person is particularly adept with 
telepathic communication without actually picking up their communication. Again, later on, we find out this is a bit of a ruse because his history goes back before this time. He's already been involved with them in ways that he's not conscious of. And so he's already been tweaked in some ways, augmented in some ways. And again, this is central to this story. And I would say central to what's going on in our reality. Vast schemes to augment, change human beings, and also introduce hybrid beings in ways that most people are just completely unfamiliar with, of course. Now, as I mentioned in the introduction, this book also goes into the supposed treaty that happened between the United States government and this consortium of extraterrestrials. And the book goes into that next. Very shocking details. And again, to many people, this will sound outlandish and sound like science fiction. But again, I've seen corroborating evidence, strong evidence suggesting this is absolutely true. Quoting again from the book, quote, Bill Walker had shown him a copy of a treaty made some years previously between the United States government and a group of extraterrestrials. Harry recalled something about it from his orientation class. Yeah, as I remember, and from what I've read since, Bill, the government gave permission to abduct and perform experiments on humans and animals in exchange for certain advanced technology. Also, the government would operate a cover-up and discrediting program to quash any publicity the abductions generated. However, the treaty did specify a quota of abductions, but ATIC suspects that the aliens have blatantly ignored that quota limit over the years. The treaty didn't specify exactly what group of extraterrestrials, but I have a gut feeling that it's the big greys. Reckon you're right there, Bill replied, reverting back to his good old boy persona. It's them big grey buggers all right, Harry continued. So tensions between humans and the big greys have escalated over the years. According to the reports, ranchers are finding more and more dead cattle with various parts of their anatomy neatly removed, primarily the rectum, vagina, penis, and testicles, ears, lips, and mouth. And there's never any sign of bleeding from the precise incisions that seem to be made with some kind of heated knife-like instrument, unquote. Now, of course, that section there speaks to some of the evidence that's been presented over time, some of the literature that's part and parcel with the UFO phenomenon the abduction of human beings, and the mutilation of various animals. Now, here I'd like to give my usual disclaimer that I believe there's different groups of the greys, even the tall greys, and it would do a disservice to the entire species to say that they are fully responsible for what's going on here. We don't want to blame all of them. Again, I think it's a specific group of the tall greys that are involved with this, and not just the tall greys. But again, there's different groups within this consortium even and you have different developmental levels even within that consortium. Consider this something like the astropolitical equivalent of the United Nations in the sense that you have a loosely organized structure around some basic principles, but often there's a lot of leeway in terms of how different actors behave within that overall structure. And of course, you have different developmental levels coexisting within the United Nations, some nations that would even be considered terrorist by other nation states, do still often exist as part of the overall structure. And again, in some ways, this is also mirrored in the astropolitical situation. But again, we want to be careful not to just group one look or one type, some typology with a particular behavior. It's more complex than that. But nevertheless, the tall greys or a group of the tall greys were known to violate the spirit of this agreement. Now, right away, we can say, what does spirit have to do with it? This notion that our government would agree to the abduction of citizens, innocent citizens from the quiet of their own homes in the middle of the night, usually, in exchange for technology. And yet that's what is suggested here. And again, the people in power, often power-hungry people like this do this. They justify this to themselves because they believe that getting the technology would ensure the ongoing superiority of that nation state over other nation states on the planet. And so in their minds, they think it's a justified sacrifice to offer up a few citizens in exchange for this technology. Again, many of us would highly question that kind of notion and that kind of agreement. And I think we need to think about power players and how we need to move beyond that zero-sum game altogether if we're really to reckon with what's being presented to us with the UFO phenomenon. But that's what's happened historically, and I think there's corroborating evidence all over the place once you actually start digging in.
And I'm talking about actual documentation, paper trails that can be verified with artificial intelligence. Once you can pour this into a database, you can corroborate these different details over time. And it becomes clear that this kind of thing did indeed happen. Some of the details from this book might be slightly off. That's not the point. The overall thrust of the message of the narrative is accurate. And that should give all of us pause, I would think. Now, getting back to the book, once we get past this initial part of the book that deals with the training of the colonel, Harry becomes a colonel, gets promoted quickly again because we find out later on he's been augmented by these beings over time when he was a child. But what this ends up resulting in basically is him running the base, or at least running the part of the operation involved with ongoing communication and cooperation with various groups of alien species that are often there on a long-term basis. Again, we find out later on that he forms relationships with various beings that are housed underground and taking part in these various experiments. But again, I just want to make the point, because this is key, that while it seems to be a strange twist of fate that he would end up on the base and getting promotions so quickly and having a central role in ongoing communication and cooperation efforts, again, it's not just coincidence. And that goes to show just how much control some of these others have over our reality. I just want to point that out. Something that's become clear to me over time is that time is a very interesting component in this entire question. And often these connections, these loops are formed between the past and what we perceive as the present and the future. And so that allows these others who have a very different relationship with time than we do, space time in general, to control the narrative, control the situation in ways that we really can't keep up with because we usually have this linear step-by-step -step experience of time. And I think key to understanding ultimately what's going on is to begin to evolve our sense of what time actually is. Because again, as Jacques Vallée famously said, what the UFO phenomenon teaches us is that we do not understand space-time. We have to grow, evolve our understanding of that if we're to make sense of what's going on in our very midst as we speak. Now, moving forward in the narrative, again, this seems like it just happens to happen, but later on we find out anything but is the case. But what happens one time is that one of these craft come in and this one actually crashes, comes in out of control. Again, it's a bit unclear, but it could have to do with radar interference, but this craft crashes. Now, Harry and his team go in to investigate and at first they think there are no survivors, but then Harry spots movement amongst the fiery wreckage of this craft, and he decides to go in and try to rescue whatever being might still be alive. Inside, he finds this small, female, gray-like being, although she doesn't look quite like the typical gray, but she's near death, but on the floor, and he picks her up, gets her out before the entire craft burns up entirely. And what's very interesting, and again, not coincidental after all we find out, he feels a strange bond with this female gray, this sort of adolescent female gray, and eventually decides that he will adopt her because he actually feels a certain fondness for her and wants to help her. And all of her other comrades, the other two occupants of the craft, died. And so she has no one on our planet to be connected to. So he adopts her. And then, as it turns out, she is so adept in human skills and human communication when compared with other hybrid beings that often are very stilted and very awkward in their communication, that it is decided by the military group, along with these aliens that are on the base, that she might be a perfect fit for a kind of socialization experiment, something they call the humanization program in the book. What this basically comes down to is trying to teach her various skills of communication so that she could actually be inserted into human society in a way that she wouldn't be exposed, her true identity wouldn't be exposed. Now, at this point, they weren't sure how likely this could be, how likely this would work, but they wanted to try because she had unusual degrees of understanding of human nature. She had a fairly large human aspect to her DNA. So she is trained by Harry and another alien being that's, again, a hybrid himself and also like this adolescent female gray 
has a high degree of capacity to interact with humans and to communicate with humans, he also helps in this process of socializing and humanizing this female Grey, who we later find out is Rachel. That's what they name her. She becomes the adopted daughter of the Colonel. This takes us to when she later on, as I said in the beginning, gets inserted into a social situation where she is paired up with a human female who's also going to college. So this Rachel character, being of around adolescent age and looking about that, is inserted into this situation where she has a roommate, they're both going to college, but again, Marissa, the roommate, doesn't have perfect vision. She sees kind of blurry images. And so the fact that this hybrid being doesn't look fully human actually goes largely unnoticed at first by Marissa because of that. But speaking of that, let's discuss Rachel's appearance. Her skin was slightly yellowish green and cool and spongy to the touch, basically the texture of mushrooms. And we find out about that later on because of an unusual encounter where her identity is basically exposed to a certain small group of people. She had large slanted eyes, wraparound type. The pupils were vertical like a cat's eyes and the color of avocado green. Now, the way we find out about what she looks like fully, and we then get to the part of the story where her identity is kind of exposed to a small group of people that are involved with the scene, is because Marissa's mother, Helen, is visiting one day. And of course, Helen, the mother, can see fully. And she notices that this female being doesn't quite look human right away. But one time, Rachel, feeling awkward, knowing that the mother can see, is kind of rushing by them on her way out, and she starts to trip on a rug. And so Helen, the mother, reaches out to help her. And when she does that, she touches her arm, and she feels that spongy, cool texture of mushrooms. It was a very hot day in the Sacramento area, where I used to live, actually. And she was not expecting that cool feel when she touched Rachel's skin. And on top of that, Rachel used to wear these large wraparound glasses, dark glasses. And at this point, they kind of fell forward. And so that was the first time that Helen, who can see perfectly, saw what Rachel's eyes actually looked like. And again, this is a title of the book, kind of a double meaning, because on the one hand, she had these large slanted eyes that were kind of an avocado green color and had pupils that were vertical like a cat's. So on the one hand, that's the startling nature of how her appearance was. But on the other hand, the book, obviously, the title is referring to life from the perspective of Rachel, who is this hybrid being. And what we later find out is that this Rachel hybrid being did have feelings that unlike some of her non-hybridized comrades, she had more of an emotional component to her because of the human DNA that had been interspersed with the alien DNA. So basically, to make a long story short, what basically ends up happening is it gets back to the colonel that this human being, the mother of Marissa, Rachel's roommate, likely knows that she's not fully human, not naturally human, conventionally human in any way. And so this scheme is devised to actually bring her into knowledge of what's going on, just the two of them, just Marissa and her mother, Helen, since they already probably know that something is awry and they want to prevent this from getting out further. So a meeting is arranged with the colonel again, the adopted father of Rachel. And while they are having a conversation, Helen and Marissa and the colonel, Rachel's actually in her room. She's too nervous to actually hear how these people will respond to her because, again, she's concerned about being rejected. So while she's waiting in her room with the door cracked open so she can hear what's happening but not be exposed to the possibility of being rejected, the colonel communicates to Helen and Marissa about the full tale, who Rachel actually is, being a hybrid being who was born on a different planet, raised in a kind of aquarium setting, never had a birthing process like a human baby would have, and was brought here on a ship and then adopted by him and now part of this humanization program. Now, what's interesting, again, because there's so many twists and turns in this book that you really need to pay close attention to, at one point, the colonel realizes it's difficult to explain this long story quickly. So what he does is he makes telepathic contact with Helen, with the mother, and basically downloads into her mind the full story, where Rachel came from, how he had been raising her, how she had been socialized in a setting 
on the base before being introduced into this human society kind of situation. Now, again, of course, that's very, very interesting. And it speaks to the fact that already the Colonel and Helen, Mercer's mother, are not average humans either. They've already been augmented themselves. So everyone involved in this case has been part of an ongoing experimentation and hybridization program to some degree going back generations. Later, we find out that Helen's mother also had experiences with the others and actually that she was the baby of actually her aunt. But at one point, the others took this genetic baby that was connected to the aunt and inserted it in her mother. So in other words, in the sister. So when she was born, she was actually born inside the womb of a woman who was the sister of her actual mother. Very strange. And again, the mother goes on to explain that she felt nervous when the Greys approached her about being part of this process because they did talk to her about it. But she agreed because she was nervous and scared and young. She was quite young when this happened. So again, these are kind of shocking details. But we also find out that there's a reason why, of course, the Colonel feels such a connection to Rachel, this alien-human hybrid, and even why Helen feels a connection to this alien-human hybrid. Like I said at the beginning with this friend of mine who met a hybrid daughter on board a craft and immediately knew that he was connected to her, this also applies here. This is why the Colonel, Harry, felt such a connection to her, because his DNA had been partly used in creating her. And likewise, also Helen, the mother of Marissa, also had DNA taken that contributed to the full genetic makeup of who Rachel is. So you see this all comes back to roost, that this is all connected, that these two human beings think they're just average human beings, but of course they're not. And later on, they begin to have memories about being part of this hybridization and experimentation program going back into their childhood and even before their childhood in the previous generation. And so we see how this is all a vast scheme that's been put together. And again, I think what this points to is that elements of the phenomenon knew the full picture in ways that none of these individuals ever really did, nor that the military really did, that also had agreed to these accords and set up actual treaties for this interstellar traffic. Very key there. I think we need to pay close attention to that. The degree of control that is being exercised here across time, even in ways interacting with time that don't make sense to us, that's what these others are able to do, and that changes the entire picture. Now, to just give you a sense of how the book ends, although I recommend you read it if you'd like to know the full story, there's so many tantalizing details that I think give clues as to what's going on in the big picture, in our reality as we speak, what ends up happening is these strange men in black-like characters show up while Rachel is living with Marissa to deliver these strange packages that she uses to eat. So there's partly this kind of slushy spinach-like heated over spinach packet that she would eat that she warned Marissa, don't eat this, it wouldn't be good for you. And a strange kind of treated water that she would also consume. And it was always delivered in these packages that had this insignia or this logo with a triangle with three horizontal lines. And of course, this has been mentioned elsewhere in other experience or testimony. So again, I, I think we have corroboration here, certain details that line up over time across all of these different abduction and contact experiences. But in the end, partly because of the fact that Rachel's identity had been exposed, it is ultimately determined by the military that it's too much of a risk at this point to keep her in that kind of humanized, socialized situation. So she disappears one day, basically. Marissa comes home, finds a note saying, I'm sorry I had to leave. I really appreciated you as a friend, Marissa, but I have to go. And I leave you with this gift. And this is very interesting and revealing here because at first Marissa is confused. What gift does she mean? She's looking around the apartment. She can't see anything that wasn't there before. And then she suddenly realizes, wait a minute, I just read this note perfectly well. My vision is perfect. So she went from seeing only blurry images and having a very difficult time reading print to suddenly being able to read it completely. And so she realized the gift had been the healing of her sight, that this is something that Rachel had done for her, which again, fits with so much of the experience or testimony around different human beings being healed as part of their contact experiences and ongoing communication with these others.
So what do you make of this narrative? Again, some people will find this far-fetched. Some people will find this very difficult to believe. But what I'm suggesting to you is that there is corroborating evidence that points towards this very kind of narrative. That even if some of the points are off, even if some of the history is not absolutely correct, the main thrusts, I believe, are. And surely that should be what we pay attention to and not any minor detail. Finally, I leave you with this concluding thought. We should face facts here. Multi-generational genetic experimentation and hybridization is happening. And while there are different reasons behind these practices, one thing seems clear. Hybrids will play a major role in the future of humanity, despite how difficult that might be for some to believe. But to that point, I would add some further context to put this in the proper perspective. The truth is, when you think about it, this notion of DNA experimentation really shouldn't surprise us because what existing evidence clearly points towards is the fact that our very presence here as the dominant species on this blue pearl of a planet is the direct result of an earlier iteration of the same process of genetic manipulation and augmentation. And on that note, we've come to the close of another edition of the Point of Convergence podcast. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash exoacadamian. But until next time, friends, from deep within the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina, this is Exoacadamian signing out.